Welcome back to the Smarter Marketer Podcast, brought to you by Rocket Agency. I'm your host, James Lawrence. Welcome back to the Smarter Marketer Podcast. Today, I am joined by Ashita Derv. Ashita, welcome to the pod. Thanks for having me again, James. This is your three-peat, your third appearance on the pod, equal second on the uh, on the leaderboard. You know, we always try to strive for better, so maybe... <laughs> The third time would be better than the last time, and we'll strike at number one. I, I hope it's as good as the first two, because they were both received I hope so too. very, very well. So for those that haven't yet listened to one of Ashita's pods, she's head of marketing here at Rocket. Um, so we get her to come in, generally, I think, on topics that are pretty practical, but we've got experience to share. Um, and today, we're going to discuss the value of webinars, and I guess the how and the why of of running webinars. Um, we run lots of webinars ourselves at Rocket, lots of our clients run them. I think generally, not always, but generally in the B2B space, um, there's definitely some do's and don'ts. So um, Ashita, welcome back to the pod and let's jump straight into it. So I think where we thought it'd be a good place to start the conversation is like why should businesses and why should in-house marketers consider running webinars in the first place? I think if we go back pre-COVID, then webinars were still around at that time, but events, it was always a question of whether you wanted to run a live in-person event or if you wanted to run an online webinar. And in my experience, webinars are way more cost-effective. Um, they have a better reach. Um, they are repeatable. And all of these reasons work in the favor of running a webinar versus an event which takes a lot more time. It takes so much pre-planning. You have to organize catering and then people don't show up and you go through all the pains of running a physical event that I'm sure a lot of email, um, sorry, event marketers would relate to. Um, so that's the reason why we kicked off with webinars at Rocket. And it, it accounts for a fantastic top of funnel marketing tool that people don't consider it to be. Most webinars, Hmm. are run for customers or product demos or things like that but it can be a fantastic prospecting avenue as well i think that's right um agree with all of your points yeah i think it was interesting wasn't it when i guess just talking about rocket like we have over the years run events we'd kind of always do an end of year event um invite clients prospective clients have partners like google and hubspot whoever else would kind of get up and speak and still lots of amazing advantages to real world in-person events and um, which, you know, not, not to discount that, but I think COVID hit webinars spiked. I think we all kind of felt maybe that that'd be kind of a temporary thing, but it feels that there is this new footing, right? Where webinars have probably kind of reestablished themselves at a place where maybe they kind of, where people thought they would go kind of maybe a decade or so ago. And um, I think the thing that I find really interesting with webinars is that physical events, um, obviously it's harder to get people to come and geographically, if you've got people um, spread, you know, in Australia, for instance, if people are living regionally or, mm -hmm. you know, the whole Melbourne, Sydney, other capital city kind of discussion, um, you'll find that obviously you can broaden your reach. I think the other thing that often isn't discussed as much is that you have certain people ideal clients, prospective clients who just don't necessarily want to go to physical events. And there's lots of people out there that probably are a little bit more introverted in the true nature of the word who prefer, mm -hmm. you know, not to be around people or don't feel comfortable coming to events um, or may go to events, but don't want to go to as many physical events. And I think that webinars do allow people that might be happier to kind of access content in the comfort of their own office or home access to your event when they may not physically. Yeah, absolutely. Not to turn this into a physical event versus no, yeah, debate. Totally. that's not our purpose. But yeah. one thing that I have experienced personally as well is that I think events have a good place when you use the event as a networking opportunity versus as an educational platform. So if you you are at a conference and you're running around from one speaker to the next and trying to scribble down notes of each person, hmm. you lose out on a heap of information and sometimes that that is what you're chasing. And I think a webinar is a better platform and a better forum to deliver that information in terms of educating your audience or even uh, letting them know about your brand. It's a, it's a fantastic tool yeah. for that. That's right. Like, and definitely when I go to conferences, for me, 
I lean more on the networking side. So I found it really hard during COVID to go to a lot of the virtual events that were spun up. And I know mm-hmm. that Dave, who's my brother and business partner, he is on the other side. He's probably more introverted in nature and much more prefers going to events to absorb the content. And I think for him during COVID, it was he was really happy that a lot of that content was accessible online. And I think that's, mm-hmm. that's not anything to do with being awkward socially. It's to do with just how people the purpose of which people go to events. So yeah, I think you're right. We're probably getting a little bit off track in terms of physical events versus why to run a webinar, but um, definitely are some of of the advantages. I I think also good for us to talk a little bit about our experience in terms of the types of businesses that um, generally would lend themselves to, to webinars. And then I guess, conversely, the types of businesses where you're you're a marketing manager of certain types of businesses probably isn't ever going to be a part of your strategy. Yeah, if you're selling physical products, uh, and specifically things like toys or clothes or, I don't know, water bottles or things like that, webinar is probably not the right <laughs> avenue for you. <laughs> um, B- the B2B SaaS space is a fantastic, um, is a fantastic uh, space product yeah. to, yeah, space yeah. to take webinars to the market. Uh, any professional service that doesn't involve, I think... I think it doesn't involve, say, physical interaction, like not hairdressers or uh, masseuses, Mm -hmm. um, but any other professional services. Um, HR, for example, ourselves, if you're selling a marketing service or a coaching business, webinars provide a great platform for those types of businesses. Um, Those are the two ones that come to mind the most. And then financial services also could use webinar as a platform. It's just that sometimes you have to be so careful with the content that they're putting mm. out. It's so censored that it may be tricky in that space. Yeah, I think that's right. It feels expertise and information are kind of where you've got deep information, you've got an area of subject matter expertise seems to be the ones that, that work work best. So B2B, lawyers, accountants, financial planners, um, SaaS, as you said, I I think the the one the two that jump out for me in the B2C space are probably educational institutions. I think I've seen mm-hmm. webinars being really well used, um, whether it's universities sure. or other types of um of education colleges. Um, I think not for profit webinars can work really well where you're kind of updating or sharing information um on a, on a theme or a topic or um a, a cause, I guess. But yeah, I think it, uh, struggle to see a lot of the more Obviously, if you're an accountant in the B2C space or a lawyer, then I could see how it could work. But I think generally, if we're talking about FMCG or goods or whatever it might be, kind of in the B2C space, probably if you're a marketer in that in that area, you're probably continuing to listen to this uh, podcast more for, <laughs> more for your general knowledge than for um, <laughs> for anything applied. But yeah, okay, I think we're we're in agreement on that. Yeah, well, I guess now moving on to the how of, of, of running a webinar, like. What what would you say is the starting point? I think like everything else, it should start with an outcome focus. Yeah, we, you need to sit down with your team or by yourself and just ponder over why you actually want to run the, the webinar. Is it to educate an existing audience within your database about a new product that you have launched? Is it about um, generating new contacts to add to your database? Is it about lead generation so you can... Um, get more inquiries about your B2B business or your product or services. So once you define that particular outcome, that will then pour into everything else. Um, for most, in most cases, webinars, I would like to promote webinars as a top of funnel promotional activity. So in that context, my outcome is n- not necessarily to get attendance and engagement on webinars. My outcome there from a gold standpoint would be I want to generate X number of contacts from this webinar, from this campaign and activity. Of those X number of contacts, some percent would then over time become leads and opportunities and deals. And that's how I view it. And you may have some business stats on the back end that you can use to predict those numbers or set those goals. So this is how I would approach a webinar. It all starts with outcome focus. Yeah, it's great. It's such a simple concept, but so true. I think until you understand or all agree on what's the purpose, why are we doing this? I think it's very difficult to then decide upon content and theme and topic and all the the technical kind of of permutations. Don't don't jump on the bandwagon. Everyone's doing it. I should too. 
Yeah, exactly right. So, and that's right. Like, I think generally we see businesses using it, using webinars really effectively as that kind of top of the funnel um, lead, not lead, sorry, just top of the funnel contact generation type area. But definitely if you're, um, you know, software product demonstrations, updates to existing clients, customers, certainly super valid reasons to run a webinar. In terms of topic and topic theme, the actual direction of content, uh, maybe good to discuss your your feelings and um, perspective on that. I think you should lean towards giving practical information in webinars. So when I say uh, practical and pragmatic, if I may say so, unless it's uh, unless you're discussing macroeconomic issues, um, I think the webinar should be focused on how your ideal persona or audience can solve a particular problem. So the actual steps should be shared. Um, if it's just a rundown of um, uh, this is what the product is and this is how we solve your problems without going into these other steps involved. This is how you can approach it. This is how you can apply that information. Um, it becomes a sales pitch yeah. and that's not that's not what you want to achieve with a webinar. Um, yeah. You want to give content in order to generate some kind of confidence within the audience that you know what you're talking about yeah, and you right. are a reliable provider. I think that's right. Like purpose of the webinar is the overarching decision to be made um we definitely see them working most effectively when you pick a specific persona that's kind of the second i guess overlay um Correct. and then the third one is practical i guess the three p's right like actually giving away practical information and you're right it, it feels like a good webinar isn't a sales pitch it's not a boring university lecture it's kind of sitting somewhere in the middle of, of those two ends of the spectrum Absolutely. So from a topic standpoint, you could go for something like how to do X, uh, how to do Y or case study on topic ABC, whatever that may be. So we've run webinars for clients that sell financial services. We run webinars for ourselves and even webinars for uh an industrial company that deals in mining and things like that. So the spectrum is quite broad. As long as you are talking directly to the audience, mm. I wouldn't be too concerned about the length of the topic should be three words or like six words and no longer than that. I don't think it's important to get into those details. As long as the topic is clear enough that it speaks to your audience, it's fine for the topic to be long or short. Yeah, that's right. Um in terms of webinar length, what's your perspective or opinion on ideal webinar length? I'd say no shorter than 20 minutes, no longer than 60 minutes. Yeah. If it's less than 20 minutes, it should be a phone call or it could be a video possibly. Um, and beyond 60 minutes, you don't have, uh, pe people don't have the ability to give you their time attention. Plus, they've got other work to do. So yeah. you can't expect people to just hang around and listen to you talk about your product, which usually happens towards the end of the session anyway. Yeah. So I would say typically design the webinar in a way where you're delivering 45 minutes worth of content, which includes some time for an introduction and segue, and then leave 15 minutes for a live Q&A and yeah. try and keep the Q&A live. It does add to the authenticity of the webinar. Yeah, that's it. Yeah, it feels unless you've got extraordinary needs, 30 to 60 minutes, hard to mount an argument to go kind of go outside of that, right? And um, that would also help you define the topic, right? If you can't explain the topic within 60 minutes, you probably need to break your webinar down into more sections yeah. or reduce the content that you're sharing. Agreed. Uh, you touched on something there with live q and I'm sure there's going to be listeners who have been tempted to pre-record webinars or the presenter um, has been agitating that they it should be pre-recorded and there's no difference. Uh, Ashita, your opinion on recording webinars versus running them live? There's a massive difference. Please run them live. Um, it I think once you run a webinar on a particular topic, the fantastic part about webinars is that it's a repeatable process. You can use the same slides, the same speaker. Prep time is minimized significantly. Uh, with pre-recorded webinars, the audience usually isn't that naive. They would know if it's a pre-recorded session. In that case, it's better if you 
just promote it as a pre-recorded webinar on a particular topic and you may get more traction from there. But if they are incessantly typing in questions for you to then answer and then you completely ignore that, it's a very poor user experience and not an ideal way to establish authority and authenticity. So I would steer away from that. Yeah, and that's right. And it's also people that work in events will tell you that there's nothing like live performance to actually get the most out of the presenter as well. It's definitely very difficult to kind of mimic a, a live production performance on a pre-recorded. Uh, I, I would also say that as, as someone who sits and manages the webinar while it's being run, you get live feedback, even if people aren't necessarily asking you questions or chatting away in the inbox. If the audience numbers start dropping off, you know it's time for the presenter to move on from the topic. And these are these are minute signals that you can use to improve your content for the future. Hmm. Um, and I don't know why anyone would shy away from receiving that feedback. So run the webinar as you planned, run it. Uh, run it in a live setting you don't need to if you have a webinar manager helping you host the session you don't necessarily have to you know keep looking at the questions box or the chat box somebody else can manage that while you deliver the content so there are many ways to uh, say tailor that session uh, but the the feedback that you get from people dropping off is something that i wouldn't want to miss and that's yeah. something you would 100 percent miss if it was pre-recorded yeah good point in terms of promotion, like how advice on how to maximize the number of quality uh, attendees that you get to a, to a webinar? Go broad, mm -hmm. go broad, go wide, and let use use the webinar as a credible reason to engage with your wide audience. Um, and this doesn't have to be your own audience. So I think like you need to step out of this is my database. I have. 5,000 people on my database, so I need to market to those. No, it can go beyond that. So naturally, there's paid promotion. You can run prospecting ads for a particular webinar, and that could be via LinkedIn or Meta Channels, Facebook, Instagram, um, or even display if it makes sense for that particular webinar. Typically, you won't receive as many registrations from there is, in my experience, or the cost per contact through those channels would be higher than what you may be willing to pay. Um, but the other channel, which is one of the most reliable one is email marketing. Now the email, email marketing, if you're marketing to another database is the best way to go. So ideally you would find a, a co-branding partner or just um, another business that shares some, uh, which is aligned with yours, but doesn't compete with your business um, and is happy to share their database. If they don't want to give you the names directly, then they can send an email on your behalf where you design the email um, and send it to them. That's that's a great way of generating a database from an external party without, without you, tinkering you, with your own brand. You're thinking paid promotion there, like a paid partnership with it, an it industry association or, yeah. Yeah, it could be both ways. Industry associations are fantastic. Uh, publications are, are a good platform because they typically have large number of subscribers and, and that can be paid as well. And what you would spend on paying for that single EDM to go out to that external database is much more cost effective than running hundreds of paid ads for 21 days. Not to forget the lead time for promoting a webinar should be no longer than three weeks. Mm. So if you are planning a webinar and it's four months away, if you start promoting it now, people are going to forget. They mm. they don't know what they're doing tomorrow. Like they don't, <laughs> they, nobody wants to lock in a one hour training session four months from now, unless I, I don't know, yeah. uh, you, you must be some kind of celebrity to get that kind of attention. <laughs> Um, it's a good so point. And I think the other benefit short lead time. Yeah. And the benefit of, um, of partnering up with whether it's a, um, kind of an, an adjacent business that has an overlapping database, but you're not competing industry association publication. You also then kind of get the, the brand credibility of a co-branded offering to their database. Third party with, authority, with third party authority, which we love. And so that, that, mm. that, that'd be, I guess, an example of that would be Rocket, where we'll we'll happily do a webinar with Mumbrella or BNT or Marketing Mag, where their publications, their their audience are the same 
audience that we have, in-house marketers, okay. um, and it's a great way of them putting the Rocket logo up there with Mumbrella or with Marketing Mag. Um, I think that's really awesome in terms of promotion and how to attract there's, people. There's one more thing that I would like to share. Yep. When, it, when it comes to promoting a webinar to your own database and you're using email as a channel, segment your database uh, as much as you can. So what that means is don't just send one blanket email in an HTML design format saying, hey, we are running a webinar and join on this date, click here to register and go through all of those things. I would highly recommend um, that if you are inviting your own database, don't ask them to fill in a form. You've already got their details. You don't need more, you know, figure out a way to get a one-click register. You can do that if you've got a strong enough automation tool. MailChimp can do it. HubSpot can do it. Bardot can do it. ActiveCampaign can do it. So based on the clicks to register, you can then just assume that they have registered for the webinar and send them the joining details. Another thing is if they have attended a previous event or a webinar, then send that segmented audience a separate email saying, hey, you've attended an event before. We'd love for you to join this one as well. If they've downloaded an ebook, send them a separate email. If you're sending the same message. Your email script isn't going to differ too much. But the fact that you are segmenting that database, having a different intro copy and probably a different subject line, that's going to give you a lot more traction than a blanket email to your entire database. That's awesome. So practical. What would you what would you then advise in terms of um, reminders leading up to the event or those types of more kind of practical tips? Um, simple things like having an add to calendar button so that they've got it in their calendar. That's a straightforward prompt. Um, I don't go crazy with reminders. I don't think people need to be reminded a week in advance and a day in advance and an hour in advance. We just send one reminder, which is a day in advance saying the webinar is tomorrow. Here is the link. This is so that on the day of the webinar, you don't want them searching their inbox thoroughly if they haven't added something to their calendar. Um, within the reminder email, we also give a link that goes directly to the platform for us at Zoom that leads directly to the webinar. So then they don't have to go download a software, go through mm. go through all the pain associated with that as well. So we're pretty, we keep it simple. And the goal is to make it as easy as it can be for the audience to come and attend the webinar. Which leads, segues beautifully into the, the next area I wanted to discuss, Ashita. How do you make sure it goes right on the day? Because I think there is that fear that there'll be a horrible technical failure, something won't happen that should happen. Um, what are the, the steps that you would advise someone to go through to increase the chances that it does run smoothly on the day of the webinar? I'd say start by being human. It's okay if things go wrong because <laughs> you can always uh, you can always fix it and people are more understanding than you would like to give them credit. So preparation is key. If you are running a webinar for the first time, if you haven't run it before, run practice sessions, set up a demo. Um, you would almost always have a webinar manager. You should have one that hosts the webinar on a separate computer and then your presenter or presenters use their own different devices. Don't, um, if you have multiple presenters, they shouldn't sit in the same room. Um, that's not ideal because the sound will echo. You don't know which mic it's picking up from. All of those reasons have them separate. Have someone from your team member sit there as an audience. Um, that's one of the key, uh, key points. Sometimes people just miss out. If you don't have a large team, then Maybe ask a friend if they can mm. hop on. This is so that they can give you live feedback on whether the audio is going okay, the slides are working, all of those things. And I think you're you're probably like underestimating, I think like uh, underplaying maybe like a Ashita, when we do a webinar at Rocket, the dress re rehearsal is a proper dress rehearsal. There's no, nothing is left to chance. It's very much, it's done at least 24 hours prior, preferably much more. Um, the tech system has to be identical to the one that you're planning on actually running so if you're setting up in a separate room set up um, she expects the slide deck to be uh, presented whoever's doing it in the webinar doing it in the dress rehearsal you need as you said you need to have that person who's, who's going to host the actual webinar because um, i think the last thing you want is when you you've, you spend all this time getting the database together people have signed up you've got the audience ready You've just got one small setting in Zoom or WebEx or whatever the, the platform is you haven't checked or you haven't tested um, or, you know, 
the, the webcam isn't connecting properly, it does create a, a huge amount of stress and tension that can kind of derail Correct. the presenter's Correct. confidence or whatever it might be. You have um, to prepare as you would for a live event. And yeah. I I think I've run probably over 80 webinars, if not 100 until now. And um, I maintain a checklist, which includes have water for the speaker. Yeah. And you're always telling me to turn my you, device off. Prior. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> every, every time we run a webinar, we still go through that checklist. So think yeah. of, think of yourself as a pilot taking off and what are the 20 things that you would do before you take off and then just go for it. You know, even, even okay, let's assume the worst case, suppose you have three attendees, you want to give those three attendees a fantastic experience and more than anything, you want to record the session so that it can be used in the future. Yeah. So don't consider a webinar an absolute fail if attendees don't show up. That's that's okay. Hmm. And even that, like that's on the checklist, right? We've Correct. never we've never not recorded a webinar accidentally, which I presume is a very common thing if you haven't, because <laughs> there's so many considerations and everyone's nervous and everyone wants it to go right. Having yeah. that checklist of that probably um nice little segue when we were preparing for this podcast, we actually remembered that we are just through COVID, we put together put together a really good uh, resource on the Rocket website, which is how to run the perfect webinar. Um, so if you if anyone's interested, it contains a lot of the um a lot of the content from today's pod. So if you simply visit the rocketagency.com.au website under resources, free guides, um, it's about the sixth one down on the right hand side. Um, but it's actually an excellent piece and probably half the content from today we kind of have taken from from that um, downloadable, which probably contains a bit more detail um, and contains some of those more checklist type type things. Um, in terms of Presume, we picked a great topic. We've done a really good job of promoting the webinar. It's all run smoothly on the day. You know, 30 to 60 minutes, say it's 45 minutes of high quality content, 15 minutes of Q&A, we record it. What is your um, advice on how to then to get the most out of that content, out of that database, out of all of that effort to maximize the value from the webinar that's been run? Uh, in three words, rinse and repeat. <laughs> so, in in terms of the content itself, you've got you've now got a warm audience. So it's only practical to send them the recording, any notes. If you have presented, say, 10 ways of doing something, then probably create a one pager with your logo on it so people can print it, put it on their desk. And that is a really nice way to keep your brand top of mind. Follow it up with nurture emails. And nurture emails, again, don't have to be very fancy. They can be plain text emails. They can have two or three questions. Support your content with case studies as well. So in one case, um, definitely send a thank you email, um, thanking them for registering. If you don't get the attendance data correctly, the, reg the thank you email to go to can go to everyone who registers. And that's one thing when you're promoting the webinar, make sure you say that the recording will be available. Many people just register for the webinar with a mm. view of watching it later, right? So you're sending that email, you're sending the slides or you're sending the recording, send them a case study the next time, ask, ask them if they have any questions. And more than anything, despite doing this kind of manual nurture, or you may have a workflow set up for these emails that go to attendees and registrations post the session, make sure you're looking up the inbox from mm. which you're sending it. I think one of the biggest mistakes that marketers do is that they go on this um, big campaign energy of you know, ensuring that the webinar is successful, that they forget about what's happening next. And you send all of these emails, but nobody is really checking the inbox. Mm. Nobody is managing the leads or managing the questions that are coming through. All of those things will count towards you generating more leads, opportunities, and sales in the future. That's it. And the um, like a, a good webinar is giving away great information, genuinely useful content for the audience. Um, but it should also contain information about the business or organization that is presenting. Like that's your right, I think, to introduce who you are and what value you can bring um, to, to prospective customers and clients. It should have an offer, but there should be something in there, which is if you're interested in an audit or more information, there should be an ask. I think you, you should have earned the right for that. Um, and it feels that a good follow-up, as you said, will include the slide deck, 
the recording, maybe some other um, content around it. But you also shouldn't shy away from repeating the ask, you know, if you are interested in that audit or appraisal or uh, pre session with one of our consultants, whatever it might be, feel free to respond to the email or book it in here or download it from there, whatever that particular ask yeah. might be. Make, make yourself available for questions um, is the way I would go about with it. And something that we haven't touched upon is who would present the webinar. I think that's an important one. And typically, I would say it would be either your uh, salesperson, who is also, in a way, the face of your company or a company director, or a genuine expert within the company. And if you have an expert within the company speaking, and they may not be able to host the webinar as well, in that case, you have somebody else from your team host the webinar, ask them the smart questions that need to be asked so that you can extract the information to share with your audience. So there are many ways to go about with that. That's it. Uh, often clients, um, or even if we run webinars, you might have the subject matter experts, maybe they're more technical, kind of saying, oh, I'm not a presenter. That's not really what I, you know, want to be doing. Correct. Correct. But but often they are the best people to do it. And you don't have to be a phenomenal presenter in the sense of, you know, fast paced and energetic and whatever. It's it's great if you do have those things. But gen generally audiences just want great content. And if it's great Absolutely. content, it's answering their questions, delivered by someone that knows the answer to these questions and is adding real value, that will always trump someone who might be a slightly better presenter but doesn't really have the substance on the actual topic 100 percent. i think that's right content content beats everything yeah that's it um Sheet, i think there's lots of practical points in there any anything else that you want to i guess recommend to to listeners out there who are kind of thinking of running a webinar or have kind of run them in the past and they might not have been as effective as as they wanted i think uh I think we've we've covered a heap as well. I'm just going through my notes, and one thing that stands out is um, just when you build your landing page, make sure it's a good and strong landing page. Don't make it too long. Get to the point. We've got another ebook on how to create good landing pages, and Rocket can help you with that as well. And when you build that landing page, ask for a question at the registration mm, stage. That's a good one. When you ask for a question at the beginning. We always uh, craft, say, the core webinar content before we begin promoting the webinar. But you can pepper in a lot of information depending on what the audience is after. And, you know, if you've got an opportunity to ask the audience directly, why not just grab onto it? It's such a good point that you raise. It really is the best way of actually finding out what people want to hear about is to ask them. Um, and you're right, like often we'll have 70% of the deck prepared but then we'll we'll shape the content. Like you might have an audience that is slightly more technical or a little bit more naive on a particular topic, and it does allow you to pitch the content at the right the right place. Um, good one, Ashita. Excellent. Okay, I think that 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 uh that's a wrap on the the pod about how to run and get the most out of a webinar. Um, Ashita, thanks for coming back onto the pod. Every time My you pleasure. come on, you share lots of practical stuff. I think if I was a listener, um, I would I'd want you to come back for a fourth. <laughs> Thank you. That's very kind. <laughs> Thanks, Ashita.